Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. Now I know that Paula and Photios said that I couldn't be with you personally in Mykonos today, but as you can see, I actually am in Mykonos. I'm just at a bar. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. We're going to be having a conversation through a whole variety of different things. The future of logistics, the future of energy, the future of customer service, and of course the future of occasions. Now my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, a futures and deep futures think tank. And I look at two kinds of futures. I look at what I call the future, which I regard as the next 20 years, because the vast majority of multinational organizations typically spend a lot of their time there, whether it's looking at the next one, two, three, five, 10, or 20 years. But I also work with all G20 governments as well, because in some cases, we need to look a little bit further than 20 years out. And we look 50 years out, where we actually start having a look at things like the future of the welfare state, future of tax, future of money, future of the financial services community, healthcare, transportation, energy, and all these kinds of other things that we care about. Now, during this presentation, I'm going to be showing you new opportunities, I'm going to be showing you new things, but I'm also going to be showing you new revenue and experience opportunities as well. So, with no further ado, I cover over 650 emerging technologies. That's it, because there really are that many. I know that a lot of people typically talk in terms of sort of five to 10 powerful technologies, such as artificial intelligence, 3D printing, 5G, blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, all those kinds of different things. But the fact of the matter is that there are hundreds of different technologies that we can increasingly combine together to create next generation products and services. Now, in addition to technology convergence, we also see a huge amount of industry convergence. And when we start putting technologies together with new trends and so on and so forth, all of a sudden the future becomes increasingly complex and confusing. So what I've created is if you scan the QR code that you can see on the screen, you can download these codexes. We've got the future of trends. So there are over 200 mega trends that as business leaders you all need to understand and grapple with to try to understand the implications and the impacts of. But there's again also hundreds of different technologies, any one of which can actually either transform your industry or every adjacent industry or every industry. Now, when we have a look at some of the innovations that these new technologies bring about, they might not affect you directly. They might, for example, be very prevalent in the energy industry. But nevertheless, as we often see, what happens in one industry often ends up impacting every other industry as well. So we'll talk a little bit through that. Now, when we have a look at the economy, I typically sort of look at the economy from three points of view. So we're all familiar with the physical economy. I buy a physical product. We're all increasingly familiar with the digital economy. I buy a digital product, often as a subscription. But as we start having a look at things like the metaverse, we're increasingly opening up this new economy. It's typically estimated to be worth between eight to $13 trillion, if you listen to the likes of Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citigroup, and so on and so forth. And when we actually have a look at the virtual economy, this is where we're buying virtual products and services. And we'll go into those a little bit later. And obviously at the Coca-Cola company, the Coca-Cola is increasingly well-versed in, shall we say, promoting, but also selling virtual products as well. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of a look at that. Now, when we have a look at things just from an emerging technology perspective, it's estimated by companies like ARK Investment that emerging technologies will destroy over $50 trillion of existing value. So $50 trillion of current GDP. And we're already seeing that. So for example, if we have a look at the energy industry, it's in the middle of a huge transition where all of the value that used to be held in oil and gas assets, products, and so on and so forth, is increasingly being eroded, and in some cases destroyed. Uh, when we have a look at the automotive industry, increasingly we're moving to new kinds of automotive business models as well as products, which means that the old legacy products and businesses are having their own value destroyed, as well as transformed and all these kinds of things. So we can see value destruction all over the place. And when you have a look at the Fortune 250, for example, there are now more organizations that are involved in the process of creative destruction, where they're purposefully trying to disrupt, not necessarily destroy, but disrupt their own businesses in order to try to future-proof themselves. Now, 
The upside of all of this is that these same emerging technologies are estimated to create up to $210 trillion of new opportunity. So these are technologies like artificial intelligence, again 3D printing, what we call general purpose technologies, genetic engineering, and so on and so forth. Now, when we have a look at your industry, your industry is changing, but so too is every other industry. There is not a single industry that is immune. And I'm gonna go into some of these in a little bit later because they do have an impact on yourselves. Now, for example, when we have a look at agriculture, we have the rise of vertical farms, cellular agriculture, which is where we take the cell from an animal, put it into a bioreactor, and we create chicken nuggets, beef burgers, or whatever it happens to be, but authentic organic meat without the animal. So increasingly, we typically talk in terms of sci-fi things that are now becoming sci-fi fact. Uh, when we start having a look at the energy industry, as I said, basically we are now transitioning from the old fossil fuel economy to the new renewable economy, and it's estimated that this alone is a $92 trillion opportunity for organizations. Uh, when we have a look at things like financial services, we see the rise of fintechs, decentralized finance, new payments and payment rails, new kinds of money and value and all kinds of other things, the rise of robo-wealth managers, automation and robotics, and so on and so forth. When we have a look at healthcare, we've already reached the point at which we can 3D print human organs and transplant them into people. And in the next 10 years, we should actually have a 3D printed heart that we can transplant into patients who need new hearts. We've also seen the emergence of in vivo gene editing, which if you have an inherited genetic disease, means that we can put you onto an IV drip while you're sitting in bed. And these new genetic engineering tools will clip out the faulty genes, clip in the new genes, the good genes, and you no longer have that inherited genetic condition. And then when we actually have a look at transportation, you know, as well as all the other industries, but when we have a look at transportation, for example, everything is going autonomous, and then we're seeing the rise of alternative fuels, particularly electrification. So not one thing is changing, everything is changing across every sector, every line of business, and every job category. Now, bringing this home a little bit more, for example, when we actually have a look at the, the food and beverage industry, Increasingly, we're seeing the rise of 3D printed foods. Now, this is just a little bit of fun, but this is a 4D printed kind of fruit. Now, whether you call this fruit or not, that's it. It has new flavors, new textures, new shapes, which then helps create new experiences. When we have a look at organizations like Unilever, Unilever are increasingly working with universities, particularly in Europe, to, to 3D print what are called metamaterial chocolates. Because when you can 3D print a product, you can 3D print it with new kinds of physical structures, which then means that from a chocolate perspective, when you actually eat that chocolate, on the one hand, it's crunchy, the next bit that you take basically is soft, you know, whatever it happens to be. So this is where increasingly organizations like Unilever are toying around with the idea of 3D printing foods and things in new ways that, again, help people experience those foods with, in new ways, but also with new textures. We're also seeing these kinds of developments with organizations like Hershey as well. But then when we actually have a look at, say, companies like Nike, you know, when we have a look at payments, payments are changing. You know, how you receive money, but also the kind of money or value that you receive. So for example, with Nike, if you have sensors in your shoes, they will let you buy products with moves. So the more that you move, the more the sensors in your shoes know that you've moved, as well as the GPS, let's see, on your phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which Nike then convert into a kind of cryptocurrency, which then lets you buy different products, whether it's from their physical stores or whether it's from their metaverse shop, which now, that's now had over 7 million people come to it. Yeah, so as I say, when we have a look at the things that are changing, not one thing is changing, lots of things are changing. So I'm going to bring this back and I'm going to show you what it means to you or what it could mean to you. So on the one hand, there's a lot more opportunity than ever before. Every threat to your business is actually an opportunity to your business, provided you have the right head on. As these changes come through thicker and faster, there is less time for you to understand what these changes could or would, will mean for you. That's it. So your ability to see these changes, understand what they are, and then create an adaptive strategy to actually 
run these opportunities and turn them into opportunities for your own business is increasingly becoming shorter. And then when we have a look at complexity, hundreds of trends, hundreds of different technologies, when you combine all these together, basically, frankly, it's just a confusing mess, uh, which is where I come in, obviously. Now, when we have a look at customer service, you know, from a basic perspective, increasingly we're seeing the automation of the customer service experience. Now, this is done via bots, artificial intelligence, conversational artificial intelligence, if I can spell that correctly. Yep, just noticed the spelling mistake. Yeah, which then leads basically to self-service. So increasingly, more of these different customer service channels basically are increasingly self-service and on-demand for your users. However, when we have a look at organizations like Mercedes, Mercedes, as well as financial services organizations like banks, like NatWest, are increasingly turning to digital humans to provide different kinds of customer service. So a digital human is a lifelike, digital version of an actual human that is able to not only talk to you using natural language and understand you using natural language and then respond appropriately, but also looks like a human in terms of body language, facial movements, and all these kinds of different things. And we see these coming through from organizations like Soul Machines, for example, as well as others. Now, when we actually have a look at the, you, how we're using artificial intelligence, for example, within call centers, in the United States, a lot of insurance companies are now using artificial intelligence to listen in on calls. Now, in some of the most appropriate cases, AI is actually coaching people, not only in the gaming arenas, but also in customer service. For example, in the CS space, these AIs will listen, on, listen in on the calls. They will sense how the customer on the end of the line is feeling based on what they're saying, how they're saying it, their tones and so on and so forth. But these AIs will then give the customer agents prompts and say, I think this customer is a bit cross. I think you should pause a little bit longer than you normally would. I think you should soften your tone. I think you should just try to back the conversation down a little bit. So increasingly, when we have a look at the future of work and HR and training and these kinds of different things, we're actually seeing artificial intelligence being used to coach people, whether it's helping them de develop new strategies in the gaming space, or whether it's helping customer service agents empathize better and more with their customers, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot changing just in that space. But again, there's a lot of opportunity to do new things in new ways. And from a customer service perspective, there is obviously still a case, point in time where you want a real human to actually be involved in front and center. But where you use those people really depends on your business, business model, basically, and how you want to support your ultimate end users, as well as any B2B customers. Now, when we start having a look at uncertainty, we're living with uncertainty all around us. You know, we can see it day in, day out in the papers. We can see it in everything that we read, everything that we watch, and generally in all the conversations that we're all having together. So on the one hand, we have a huge amount of economic uncertainty. You know, we're seeing a massive rise in living costs at the moment. We're seeing inflation in the developed world running at anywhere between about 10 to 16 percent. Inflation in the less developed world, in some cases, is running well beyond 30 percent. And we obviously have a lot of conversations being centered around the future recession. In fact, there are a lot of economies now that it's almost this sort of game of whack-a-mole. Are they in a recession? Aren't they in a recession? And so on and so forth, which then obviously has an impact on consumer behaviors as well as revenues, profits, and everything else. You know, we have environmental challenges. You know, When we have a look at the rise of extreme weather, for example, we now have 600 times more extreme weather events than we have had in the past. We have more multi-billion dollar extreme weather events than we've ever had in the past. Yeah, so, for example, since about the year 2000, insurance organizations have paid out over $3 trillion simply because of extreme weather events. So this is floods, droughts, and so on and so forth, hurricanes, etc. And that's excluding any conversations about climate change and the impact that climate change and rising sea levels is going to have on where you base your operations. So I speak to lots of organizations that increasingly are starting to think about moving their operations, like their factories, for example, away from the coastlines, you know, or out of this area, moving it to that area. Um, when we start having a look at military, you know, so as we move from a 
unipolar world to a bi or multipolar world, for example, we're seeing a rapid increase in the amount of military action. That's it. And this is actually not a new trend. Every time there is a global shift, particularly at the political and economic level, we often actually see militaries being rebalanced. And that's happened for hundreds of years. When we have a look at politics, obviously we see the rise of China, which then means we sort of are looking forward to this bipolar world, which again creates these frictions basically between leading economies. So for example, the US, Europe as well, but also China and other economies in, in Asia, such as India. And when we actually have a look at this, this is now starting to lead to another trend called strategic dislocation, where the vast majority of organizations who don't like the fact that we see new tariffs on particular countries, we don't see that we don't like the rise of protectionism, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, are now starting to move different parts of their supply chains out of one country, say, for example, China, and starting to move it to India or to South Korea or wherever it happens to be. Vietnam is another sort of popular one. So from a political perspective, we're seeing a huge amount of change. We're also seeing the rise of fragile government. Uh, we are starting to see the influence of global institutions being questioned as well as being run down uh, and lots of others. We're seeing technology standards fragmentation, whether, for example, it's artificial intelligence or 5G and so on and so forth. So there's a lot sort of there's a lot of uncertainty here. Then we have societal. You know, we've just been through a giant pandemic. You know, one in six people, it's now estimated, have mental health issues. You know, society's behaviours have changed, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, and then from a technological perspective, there's a staggering amount of change. And to see that, you just have to look out the window or go online or pick up your augmented reality smartphone, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from a technological perspective, it can also be argued that increasingly every organisation is a tech company first that then happens to do something else. Sell cars, sell financial services, sell entertainment, and so on and so forth. Now, what all this means, basically, is that this means resilience is no longer optional. And increasingly, resilience is the number one thing that is on most organizations' minds. Whether it's trying to build resilience around energy prices and just on the gas prices recently, we've seen them spike by 244% whether it's trying to manage the impact of extreme weather, where, for example, in Japan, as well as the US, they're talking about instituting a new Category 6 hurricane scale, you know, which, that's fun. Um, supply chain disruption. So when we actually have a look at supply chains, for example, it's generally estimated that 85% of supply chains are not resilient. You know, we buy everything that we buy from one place, not multiple places, and so on and so forth. Um, we also see the rise of resource scarcity, and we also see certain resources being used as geopolitical, shall we say, weapons or toys, whatever phrase you want to use, whether it's things like rare earth metals, basically whether it's things like, you know, semiconductors and so on and so forth. So resilience should be at the very top of your priority list as we start going into the new, new normal. But from a farm perspective, when we have a look at your ingredients, what about getting your ingredients example, when we actually have a look at things like vertical farms, especially as it relates to the beverage industry, you might not think that being able to grow lettuce inside a vertical farm is at all relevant to yourselves. However, when we have a look at the perfume industry, the perfume industry is increasingly starting to grow some of its premium crops, products in vertical farms, because these vertical farms guarantee supply. The vertical farms are next door to you, not on another continent. 
and so on and so forth. So actually, when you have a look at the use of vertical farms, basically for, shall we say, non-food related products or non-agricultural products, there's actually a very big opportunity to use vertical farms as a way to improve your supply chain resilience. And then when we actually have a look at water, for example, you know, so water is an entire conversation in itself. You can extract water from the air using 3D printed heat exchangers like these, which then mean that those vertical farms can grow crops using 100% less potable water. Plus, basically, as these air extraction systems start scaling up, that actually has an impact on what the United Nations call in 2030 water wars, as we start seeing 129 countries coming under water stress. So in the atmosphere, we have over 2.4 zettatons worth of water. Now, up until recently, it's been very difficult to extract it, but increasingly we're able to extract water from the atmosphere into industrial volumes. Not quite at your volumes, but nevertheless, just putting this on the radar. So when we have a look at energy, everything is being electrified, whether it is transportation, whether it's heavy industry or every other industry. And as we start electrifying things, that means basically that increasingly we can start switching to renewable energies, such as wind and solar, which made up about 80% of all renewable energy installations last year, which peaked 250 gigawatts for the first time. Where fossil fuel installations, from an energy generation perspective, was actually only at 65 gigawatts last year. And that's actually a decreasing, well, it's a decreasing amount, but it's also an increasing trend. Now, when we actually have a look at the trend, the, the Diesel, for example, that your logistics fleets use. In Europe, there's a heavy promotion of solar fuels. So solar fuels actually use a process of artificial intelligence, or artificial photosynthesis, sorry, to extract carbon dioxide from, from the air and then turn that into what we call green diesel. So essentially, we are making hydrocarbon fuels from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which means they're carbon neutral which you can then put in a standard semi-truck and so on and so forth. However, we're seeing the rise basically of everything from hydrogen as well. So we see blue and green hydrogen coming through. Um, when we have a look at, for example, solar, you know, so solar is now the cheapest form of energy ever. It's at $20 per megawatt hour and it's falling. We can see a point in time where it actually becomes pretty much a billionth of a cent per megawatt hour to generate electricity from solar. Wind is the same. If you have a look at the cost of generating wind or energy from wind, you know, we see all the graphs do this. But from a solar perspective, you know, today we have solar panels that are 17% energy efficient, but we already have solar panels coming out of the labs and commercializing that are 20 to 30% energy efficient, which then means that the cost you would pay is falling substantially for electricity. Uh, when we actually start forward looking, we've got energy pan we've got solar panels that are 132% energy efficient already in the labs, as well as 80% and so on and so forth. Now, if we include and incorporate bacteria into a solar panel, we can generate electricity even when it's cloudy. For example, in anywhere in Europe, we can generate electricity at night. We can generate electricity from ambient light. If you put graphene over the top of a solar panel, then when it rains, that solar panel can generate electricity from rainfall, from snow, and so on and so forth. So we are rapidly starting to approach the point at which regular solar panels, which are commercially available, will be able to generate electricity 24-7, which then means that we aren't as reliant on grid-scale storage. Now, when we have a look at a lot of the plants, especially in plant operators out there, a lot of their plants basically are actually run on natural gas, LNG. However, when we have a look, for example, in Spain, we see the dramatic rise of biogas. But thanks to a variety of different universities in Europe, we can now convert biogas into hydrogen. And then thanks to other universities, again in Europe, we can now use that hydrogen to power gas turbines, traditional gas turbines that don't need to be retrofitted. So we actually have a, an increasingly sophisticated and clever way to convert traditional legacy gas-powered turbine systems to use hydrogen, which is then obviously zero emission. 
When we start having a look at hydrogen itself though, depending on where you are and the kind of operator that you are, if you are desalinating, if you are desalinating water from the sea, increasingly, as we see in in Neom, which is in Saudi Arabia, it's a half a trillion dollar smart city. Increasingly, we can desalinate water from saline sources. We can then do that using renewable energy, typically solar, which drops the cost of desalinated water by about 60%, which again is significant. However, in addition to that, thanks to new filtration systems, we can actually filter the brine that is the result of that desalination process for lithium, which we can sell for $5,000 a kilo to supply the electric vehicle industry. So that's a new revenue opportunity. And it's also something to put into business models when we're actually having a look at scaling up desalination plants. But you can also mine uranium from seawater as well. So when we actually have a look at the business cases for desalination plants, this one slide instantly changes the economics of desalinated water for everybody everywhere. When we have a look at battery storage, lithium ion batteries basically can now store an electricity at about $110 per kilowatt hour and that keeps coming down. But increasingly again in Europe, organizations like Carrefour are actually starting to store excess energy produced by the grid from renewable sources in water. So they use energy to turn the water into ice and then when that energy that's locked up in the ice is needed again, it's just translated back. So there's a whole variety of new energy technologies which make a whole variety of new things possible, including in the logistics space, but also from the revenue opportunity standpoint. Now, when we have a look at logistics, increasingly we're moving to mobility as a service because we have the rise of autonomous vehicles, but increasingly we're also talking about mobile services. So for example, I could bring a mobile platform to you and that could be anything. Now, when we have a look at, for example, the rise of autonomous vehicles, everything is going autonomous, whether it's cars, whether it's semi-trucks basically that you rely on, or whether it's drones, whether it's cargo ships, even spacecraft are actually going autonomous with organizations like the ESA. So everything is going autonomous, which then means we have the death of the car. Because if you take the steering wheel, the dashboard and the pedals out of the car, or even really out of any vehicle, you no longer have a traditional vehicle, you have a blank space. Now this is particularly important when we start thinking about the future of occasions. Now, increasingly, a lot, of these, a lot of these future vehicle formats, like those from Mercedes, as well as Toyota and so on and so forth, vehicles are increasingly modular. Yeah, we have a common base. That base goes into a depot. One minute, basically, it's a commuter van or you know, commuter coach, basically, in the morning. Then it comes back in, then it's a delivery van, then it's a car, then it's a whatever. So the rise of modular vehicles is quite an interesting opportunity. When we see the rise of alternative fuels, particularly as it relates to autonomous vehicles, we've got, we're moving from internal combustion engines to battery electric vehicles, to fuel cell electric vehicles, particularly in the semi, in the semi truck, in the semi truck, uh, semi truck space. And then we have solar vehicles as well. But the solar vehicles are typically more in the truck space and the small format uh, car space. Now, this is actually a future truck. This is already being rolled out to some degree. They're doing a lot of the prototypes and prototyping at the moment. Uh, but this is a fully autonomous truck from Volvo. Now, on the one hand, it doesn't look like anything basically that you've actually bought before. It doesn't look like anything you use today. However, from an engineering and support and maintenance perspective, it has predictive support and maintenance. There is no operator. Uh, it's autonomous. Yeah, it has very few moving parts and so on and so forth. Basically, so the cost of managing your fleets changes significantly by about 20 to 30%. It's also a supercomputer on wheels. It's packed with GPUs. So imagine your logistics fleet going from costing you a lot of money to run and operate and manage to now being able to mine their own cryptocurrency. 
So in the US, we see organizations like Daymac that are using these vehicles to make money. So we mine cryptocurrency with an autonomous vehicle. Now, when we have a look at Coca-Cola, for example, if you have a solar powered truck, bearing in mind solar panels are getting more energy efficient, as we sort of mentioned earlier, what you have here is you have a truck that generates its own electricity. Doesn't need to be plugged into the grid, not in the same way that we sort of think of today. However, this truck can wirelessly transmit the power, any excess power that it generates to other assets, to other trucks, just like we wirelessly charge your smartphone, which now means that what you have is you have a logistics fleet that generates its own electricity, and that electricity can be transmitted to the grid or to anywhere else. At which point, we can now start talking about Coca-Cola or any logistics organization or operator actually becoming an energy utility. So the future is weird. Technology lets us do new things in new ways and often in unexpected ways. When we have a look at organizations like Tesla, for example, all of these different trucks and these vehicles that you have in your fleet will generally, even today, have some form of lithium ion battery. Now, depending how you're charging that, if you're charging that with solar panels on the roof of your factories, any excess energy at the end of the day can be fed straight back to the grid, which in this particular case means you can now sell electricity to the grid operators. So again, you, we have a new way to help you make your fleet make you more money than it ever did before. So are you prepared for your logistics fleets to go from costing you money to potentially making you money. That's a mind shift at the CEO's office. Plus, when we look at occasions, drink and don't drive, is that the new mantra? Because if we now have blank spaces, what beverages do we have in those blank spaces? If you have a mobile office, what are you drinking? Yeah, particularly if it's later at night. If you are commuting home, what do you drink at night? You know, if you are entertaining and socializing basically in these blank spaces, what are you drinking? You know, when we actually have a look at other slightly stranger concepts, with companies like Aprilia, we see the rise of fully autonomous travel suites, essentially hotel rooms that take you from your point of origin all the way through to a hotel. And these particular um, sort of ATSs, as they're called, slot straight into the hotel. So, Recently, I did some work with Disney and Universal, and we're sort of talking about you know, what happens basically when you, know, you get in your literal hotel suite at home. That hotel suite drives you to a hotel or a destination, parks itself in said hotel, and then you get out and you go to a theme park. So these blank spaces offer you new occasion opportunities. And then there's this. We have a blank space as a service, and that blank space as a service can be a hotel as a service, a gym as a service, a shop as a service. That's bar as a service. So I just came back from Vegas and saw those robots. Why can't you put those kind of cocktail mixer robots, for example, actually into any autonomous vehicle? So now you have bar as a service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what kind of new experiences could you actually create with these kinds of technologies converging? Now, when we have a look at metaverse, yeah, 
The metaverse has only recently actually got a dictionary definition, but at a very high level, it is the physical, digital, and virtual worlds colliding and merging together in such a way, basically, to give us new opportunities. It's also a slow burn mega trend. Realistically, this is sort of 2030 onwards. You know, we're in that massive hype cycle at the moment. Now, when we have a look at Coke, Coke created the Pixel. Uh, now, Coke started selling virtual Coca-Cola within Roblox, and it would give people an energy boost, but then they could also cash that out, and they could actually get the real Coca-Cola in the real world. That's it. So, again, as I said earlier, you have a physical product, a digital opportunity, but also a virtual product as well. Now, when we have a look at, for example, Diageo, Diageo, I see are now starting to sell rare whiskies like this one with $35,000 NFTs and experiences. And they sold out of these. That's it. Now, NFTs are a question, non fungible tokens are a sort of entire conversation by themselves. But nevertheless, when we start combining things like the metaverse together, basically with Web 3.0 technologies, we get all kinds of new opportunities. Now, the metaverse at the moment is really quite a basic construct. We can interact with it using sight, sound, as well as touch. So, for example, if we have haptic clothes, then you know, I can high-five you if you have a haptic glove, and I can feel you high-fiving me, even though you might be on the other side of the planet. So this is where the metaverse does actually open up some new opportunities, but again, remember, it's a slow-burn trend. Now, when we start seeing the rollout, as we already are, obviously, as of 5G, 5G enables a lot of new immersive technologies. In fact, it's generally thought as being the killer app. Now, when we start combining things like haptic clothing, but also virtual reality glasses, you know, if you see this chap here, he looks like he's wearing sunglasses, courtesy of Meta, Panasonic, and HTC, we are literally at the point now where we can almost get rid of these big, bulky virtual reality headsets. So if you want to enter the metaverse, you put on some glasses, you're in. Take them off, you're out. Now, in terms of the controllers, we can use or artificial intelligence combined with cameras in these different glasses to sense where your hands are and so on and so forth. So we no longer have to go into the metaverse with these bulky controllers and these bulky headsets any longer. The impact that that has is that it means from a customer perspective, your customers can enter the metaverse easier than ever before. And as we see, convenience is important because when we have convenience, people are much more likely to adopt new products and new ways of doing things. Now, Metaverse 2 is really about full immersion. This is where we actually have, for example, in Japan, we, can, we have the gadgets and technologies to let us taste virtual food, as well as smell virtual smells. So now think about how we actually apply that to the food and beverage industry. What can you start doing with that? And then increasingly, courtesy of organizations like HTC, you can use your brain to navigate around in these virtual reality worlds like never before. Which then brings us to the question, when Metaverse 2 starts emerging, which is really a sort of longer burn trend, 2030 to 2035, from a consumer perspective, bearing in mind technology is already allowing us to do this today. That's it. What could you do with that? And then, in addition to that, we see the rise of digital humans within the Metaverse. So, for example, increasingly, if you do go into the metaverse, you might very well find yourself talking to a virtual being rather than a human that is indistinguishable from a real person. So, again, from an experience perspective, these really do start mixing up and changing how we think about future experiences in these different sort of parallel worlds that increasingly different generations and different people among us will actually experience and maybe even live in. But that's another conversation. And then tokenization, when we have a look at Web3, you know, if you have distribution centers, if you have factories, if you have logistics uh, assets and so on and so forth, increasingly we can use a concept called tokenization. Now token basically is where I give you a digital token, for example, like you know, when we hand coats in at the uh, hotel. I can give you a digital token and that digital token signifies that you own a particular asset. But I can now start buying shares in that particular asset. So you could actually have a distribution center. You could tokenize it using companies like ADDX or SDAX out of Singapore. And now you can sell what we call fractional shares. So it's a bit like buying shares in a regular public limited company to anybody, which is a little bit like crowdsourcing. 
Now the impact of this means that you could actually build new infrastructure without having to go to the banks to raise capital. So even though tokenization from this perspective is a relatively newish trend, nevertheless, it's a significant one. And organizations like Citi, as well as BCG, as well as ADDX, estimate basically that the token economy will be worth anywhere up to about $86 trillion, depending where you put the high and low watermarks. And there are even some that think the token economy will be bigger than the, than the entire global economy. And you can also tokenize algorithms and other assets. So if you have data or if you have an, a particularly good artificial intelligence algorithm, you can tokenize that as well. And you can sell shares in your algorithms. So literally, the world is your oyster when we start talking about how you can earn money from new things in new ways. Now we have the end of choice. We start seeing the rise of more digital channels than ever before. We see the need for multi-generational strategies as well. That's it, because the way you sell to an older person is different to the way that you send to sell to younger generations. We also have the concept of increasing, increasingly moving from binary information to biometric and biomarker information. And we'll come on to that in a bit. But we also have the rise of virtual influencers, again, digital humans. Now, when we talk about personalized advertising, and personalized targeting. If I have a smartwatch, it's streaming information about, for example, how hydrated I might be. That can be sent back to base, could be sent to you, and then all of a sudden you know that I'm dehydrated, and then by the time I get home, you could have actually delivered something to me by drone. So when we start talking about the way that we identify new opportunities, we target people at a biomarker, but also biometric level to do new things in new ways. There's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and we can go even further than this. So we move from analytical and logical data processing to predictive data processing. And we go from omnichannel strategies to opti-channel strategies. And then, of course, we also have this concept. When we're actually looking online for products, how many of you see recommendations made to you by the algorithms? So if we're looking at premium spirits, for example, whose recommendation engines are people actually using? You know? So when we start having a look at that, if I'm looking for a particular kind of beverage to suit a particular dinner party, then am I being shown your products or somebody else's products? So this is increasingly where we kind of have this concept of the end of choice, because if the algorithm only shows me three things based on what it thinks I want to see, am I choosing or is it choosing for me? And then finally, when we actually have a look at occasions themselves, having sort of gone through everything else, and I realize this is dense, but this presentation is dense because there is a lot changing. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a op lot of opportunity to experiment and do new things in new ways. When we have a look at consumer behaviors, in Asia especially, we see the rising middle class. By 2030, it's estimated we will have 600 million new middle classes. We have the rise of so the socially conscious consumer. So for example, how you behave as a business, where you source your products from, your ESG scores and ratings really matter increasingly, particularly post-pandemic, people are, are much more likely to seek out social experiences. There's also value alignment, basically, where value basically is whether it's to do with my purpose, my mission, my own values, and your company values. You know, we've seen that with Patagonia, for example. It recently just got given to a charity. So customers are much more likely to align their values in new ways. And then we have value hunters because increasingly we see cost of living increasing. And when we start having a look at hunting out value, it does depend on the demographic that you're actually looking at. And then wellness, particularly post pandemic, we're seeing a massive interest in wellness, you know, whether it is buying products that is good for us, consuming products that are good for us, and so on and so forth, albeit in some things in moderation. Now, when we start having a look at combining the data that I talked about earlier, yeah, biomarker and biometric data, 
when we have a look at industry four, we can do some new things. So for example, we've already seen artificial intelligences that are able to create new recipes. Using industry four, we can actually make small batches of products easier and cheaper than ever before. Personalized products. And when we actually have a look at personalization, 75% of people want personalized products and they are likely to stick around and recommend you as well. And those premium, those personalized products can be sold at a premium. So for example, if I've just come out, if I've just come off of a presentation, and I'm really stressed, then my smartwatch can detect my cortisol levels. That can be sent back to Coca-Cola HQ and the concept teams. And the artificial intelligence then makes me a specific mixer. And it has that delivered to me via a whole variety of different modes and different means and everything else. But now you can actually use Industry 4 combined with Internet of Things and wearables and biomarker and biometric data to actually start creating personalized drinks in new ways. And then, because we have access to a lot of your information, including your diary, these same artificial intelligences and machine systems know that I've got a dinner party later. So not only do I have a custom cola waiting for me, but I can have a bottle of Campari waiting for me at home as well. So this is where we talk about things like subscription models, know your customer, you know, KYC, et cetera, et cetera. But this bottle of Campari could increasingly come with an NFT, that sort of virtual component that I talked about. And it could be delivered by drone. Yeah? And actually, when we talk about drone deliveries in both the UK, the US, as well as Middle East, increasingly drone, the ability to deliver things by drone is being ramped up. And we actually see a lot of e-commerce giants, especially trying to do deliveries within an hour. So there's a lot of ways that we can actually create and tailor products at a personal level to people, but actually get them delivered faster than ever before. Bearing in mind, again, all of these contain a premium, which is good for profits. Now, increasingly, we can use 3D, the likes of 3D printing. So for example, when we 3D print glass, as anyone by seeing the beverage industry will be able to tell you, the kind of glass that people drink their beverages from matters. Because increasingly, if we can 3D print glasses, we can 3D print them at the nanoscale, which then means they can effervesce in different ways. They can assume different tastes, different smells, all those sorts of things. So when we actually think about the future of drinkware, which is generally underrated as part of the end user consumer experience in occasions, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. They can even have built-in electronics. And in Japan, we've seen cocktail sticks, for example, that now have built-in electronics, and they actually change the taste of whatever it is that you are tasting. So things can taste a little bit more salty, and so on and so forth. So when we actually talk about glassware, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. And some of it sounds odd. Extended experiences. You know, when we start thinking about combining augmented reality, especially basically with bottles, you know, all of a sudden you can tra be transported into a completely different kind of experience because we have smart bottles, and so on and so forth. So when we start having a look at travelers, basically from a trends perspective, Visa, when we compare things to 2019, pre-pandemic, travelers basically are not, international travelers are not quite yet at pre-pandemic levels within Europe. There are fewer people traveling compared to pre-pandemic, but they are spending more and they are staying longer which has an impact on your business because these people are spending su substantially more, which then means that from a drinks and beverage perspective, they're also much more likely to be buying premium drinks. Now, we also see the rise basically of smaller, more intimate gatherings as well, whether it's at home basically, or whether it's actually out and about. And increasingly, as we see the cost of living crisis bite, we see people adopting a home first entertainment strategy where they might now go out two times a week, whereas before they might have gone out three to four times a week, and the rest of the time they're now at home. That's it. So we're actually seeing the number of times that people leave their houses to go out to a venue, whether it's a pub, whether it's a dinner, a restaurant, or whatever it happens to be, that's changing as well. And then 
from a consumer perspective, increasingly there's this concept of simplicity. Less is more, less clutter, less fuss. Keeping it simple, as they say. And then when we have a look at things like experiential occasions, we're seeing the dramatic rise of online cocktail courses, as well as online tasting sessions as well. And then we can also mix realities. So again, you know, whether it's a QR code, whether it is any other kind of beacon, you know, we're used to sort of drinking drinks basically in a relatively 2D format. You know, I pour a drink and it's right there in front of me. But increasingly, using a variety of different immersive technologies, you can do all kinds of different things with that drink. So again, you know, how we use augmented reality, both whether it's in the sort of the glassware, the bottle, basically, or whether it's actually the drinking experience itself, can actually change basically people's perception of the event and the experience that they're actually experiencing. And then finally, if we are going to all dive into virtual reality in this thing called the metaverse from 2030, then increasingly we have this concept of virtual gather gatherings. Now, if we have a look at virtual gatherings during the pandemic, Travis Scott held a virtual reality or virtual gig and had 15 million people attending. So when we actually have a look at this virtual space as an opportunity. There is a lot of opportunity there, but it does require a new mindset, new products, and new ways to engage customers. Now, there was one company but in sort of 2019, 2020 uh, called Food Inc. in London that actually started combining experiential dining, which is things like 3D printed food, 3D printed chairs, art, music made by artificial intelligences with virtual reality. So increasingly, as we start looking at the future of occasions and start projecting that forward, we get experiences a little bit like this, which might look a little bit odd, but apparently they were charging $250 per ticket per seat. That's it. And they were packed out continuously. Here we go. This is Foodie, a UK company. So as you can see from my presentation, the future itself is a veritable experience. So my name is Matthew Griffin. I hope you've enjoyed the show. And as for me, I'm actually going back to the real bar now. So I'm looking forward to Q&A in a little bit.
Thank you very much for listening and good health. Take care.